when any flaw shows up, the glamour is dispelled and suddenly they become terrible. Hi, I'm Ted Balaker with Reason TV, and today I'll be sitting down with Virginia Pastrell. Pastrell is the author of two books, The Future and Its Enemies and The Substance of Style. She's former editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine and current editor-in-chief of DeepGlamour.net. Tell our viewers about DeepGlamour.net. Uh, DeepGlamour.net is a group blog that I edit. I write for it, but I also have a number of contributors. And it is about exploring glamour in its many manifestations. Uh, and it's deep. We write essays. It's not a you know, street fashion blog or something like that. My view of glamour is that it is not a style. It is not just about movie stars and it is, in fact, a powerful form of visual rhetoric and persuasion and an imaginative process like humor that takes place between an audience and an object but takes many different forms depending on the audience and what they find glamorous, just like humor, and depending on the cultural context. And you've called glamour a beautiful illusion. Yes. A lot of people would say, well, maybe that describes President Obama. You know, I have to say, I, he's like God's gift to my glamour project. <laughs> uh, because glamour is an illusion and it is a particular form of illusion. It's an illusion that tells the truth about the audience's desires. And it requires mystery and distance. And what you saw during the campaign was people projecting onto Barack Obama whatever it is that they wanted in a president or they wanted even in a country. And to the degree that people would project onto him the idea that he was lying, which is usually a bad thing, but they would project onto him that he was lying uh, about his positions because he really secretly agreed with them uh, as opposed like the, to, the for, NAFTA. for example, on trade. But there were other examples, but the, the biggest one was about he's really, you know, anybody that smart has got to really be a free trader at heart. He's just saying this to pander to those idiots, you know. Uh, he can't really mean it. And, and you've seen as he's actually taken office and tried to govern uh, this back and forth where he is consciously or unconsciously trying to maintain his glamour, which requires a kind of distance from the political process so that people can continue to see him as representing them regardless of their contradictory views, while actually trying to be president, which means you have to decide what to do about Guantanamo. You have to decide you know, what health care bill you're going to back. You have to decide all these things and you're going to make somebody realize that they're disillusioned. And right this morning I saw that the former editor of Harper's is about to write a, a book, uh, The Mendacity of Hope, attacking Obama from the left. You know, uh, And this is, I think, that's the power and the downside of glamour. Well, let's uh, step into the way back machine for a moment. I'm going to read you something you wrote uh, in an April 2008 column, quote, Obama's glamour gives him a powerful political advantage, but it also poses special problems for the candidate and, if he succeeds, for the country. Um, can you explain what you meant back then and how it's played out? Uh, one thing as a candidate, um, the, the sort of flip, and also as, as president, the sort of flip side of glamour is horror. People say, oh, there's something hiding. It must be something terrible. And so in the campaign, it was oh, it must be that he's, you know, secretly a radical Muslim or, you know, he's, and later on it's like he's secretly really born in Kenya, you know, he's not really, as opposed to just, you know, he has policies that are bad for the country or something more conventional politics uh, uh, objection to a candidate. Uh, so that is one type of disadvantage. And the other is the one that I just talked about, which is that there's always this this capacity for disillusionment even among supporters because people have projected so much of what they think, including things that are sort of impossible, uh, into a glamorous figure that when any flaw shows up, the glamour is dispelled and suddenly they become terrible. Is it impossible to live up to this illusion? And so is glamour something that's good for a candidate 
but bad for a president seeking re-election after people have realized, oh, he couldn't have possibly lived well, up to all the, of our hopes. The two glamorous presidents in my lifetime besides Obama, the first was JFK. And he dealt with this problem by getting killed. And you know that was something I didn't want to mention in an right. article about Obama, but that, that really, I mean, there were lots of problems in the Kennedy administration that, uh, and lots of secrets that were being hidden uh, that came out later, but because he'd gotten assassinated, there was the glamour state. The other glamorous president in my lifetime, I would argue, is actually Ronald Reagan. He managed to govern because he actually did stand for some some specific ideas that brought a broad consensus of supporters together. Uh, he was still a figure of distance and mystery, but there was a core of identifiable beliefs that were not an illusion, that were in fact uh, there, and that was that enabled him to govern uh, and also to maintain this sort of glamour uh, particularly to the Reagan coalition, you see that where people of different persuasions, you know, libertarians would say, well, he's really more libertarian, and social conservatives would say, well, he's really more social conservative. Uh, but he did have these kinds of specific beliefs that held those people together. They didn't hold together so well after him. How about the uh, junior senator from Massachusetts? Is Scott Brown glamorous? He's probably glamorous to some people, but I think in his case, he's more representative of a cause. And um, it's not about his personal glamour or what people project into him, but more, you know, he's going to be that 41st vote, that, that sort of thing. Is Sarah Palin glamorous? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think when she was first nominated, I wrote uh, a post on Deep Glamour about going to the Cowgirl Museum in Fort Worth when I lived in Dallas and being surprised at what cowgirls were really like and how they were these incredibly glamorous figures and not entirely in an illusory way. And I think she does have some of this kind of frontierswoman, multi-competent sort of glamour to her but I think she's not primarily a glamorous figure. She's too familiar. And in fact, her for people who like her, uh, it's her familiarity, her ordinariness. She's an extraordinary version of an ordinary person. Uh, and that's what's appealing. And that's not glamorous. So it's a different kind of appeal. It's like, I don't know, the, the appeal of Sandra Bullock versus the appeal of, uh, of uh, Angelina Jolie or Grace Kelly or something. Like it's the, she's more the girl next door, if you will. Mm -hmm.